The years after leaving prison hadn't exactly gone perfectly for Adolf Hitler. He had trouble reintegrating and getting into the swing of things at first, but this wasn't his biggest issue. The nation had completely changed during his months in a cell. The inflation that had completely crippled Germany was now being resolved and conditions weren't nearly as bad. It goes without saying that extremist parties don't do quite so well in times of stability. Regardless, Hitler set about laying the groundwork for the future, and he was busy building what was essentially a state within a state. The National Socialists had every base covered, and they had a man for everything, so when they somehow came to power in the future, they would be ready. Over the years between his release and 1928, he had resolved an issue that could have easily led to the death of the party. Gregor Strasser and his secretary, Joseph Goebbels, in the north of Germany, had been pushing for a kind of national Bolshevism, rather than national socialism. In their plans included such extreme acts as the total abolition of private property and a huge class struggle. Obviously, Hitler's vision of class unity didn't mix well with this at all. He won over Goebbels to his cause and at the Bamberg conference made it clear that he was the leader and this potential split was to stop. All party district leaders must now directly follow the original 25 points of the party and all must personally pledge loyalty to the Führer. By 1928, he was back in the driving seat in his new home being rented to him by a party member, the Berghof. His sister, and more importantly, her daughters, moved in with him to be the ladies of the house to keep him company. Hitler took a particular liking to Gelly, his niece. The exact nature of this relationship is impossible to say, but we shall find out what we can in this video. Some believe he was deeply in love with her. Others believe he was more of a deeply caring uncle. You can decide for yourself. Before we begin, A. This video is part of a larger series, but can just as easily be viewed individually, if you want to start from the start. The link is in the description, or on my channel homepage. B. This video is by its very nature controversial, because it's about Adolf Hitler. Obviously, I'll express no views of my own in this video, and this is purely a historical work, so please use common sense. And most importantly, C. A huge thank you to my patrons, who make these videos possible. If you enjoy these videos, then please consider clicking the link in the description to join our Discord or our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, or simply if you just want to support the channel. Even the $2 tier helps more than you can imagine. Thank you. In 1928, after the recent defeat in the elections, two men, most of all, had not lost faith. These were Adolf Hitler himself and the new rising star in the Nazi party, Joseph Goebbels. He reached out to the working classes, especially those who had voted leftist. He said to them that workers under a capitalist state were, quote, no longer a living human being, not an originator, not a creator. He is changed into a machine, a number, a robot in a factory, without sensibility or goal, end quote. He spoke of how National Socialism could give these people's lives meaning again. Hitler was absolutely delighted with Goebbels' efforts, and he quickly became Hitler's most reliable party member. He was promoted to propaganda chief of the party, a role he would go down in history for. Since the near split in the party, Gregor Strasser too had worked his way back in close with Hitler, who could be pretty forgiving of old foes if it was clear it wouldn't happen again. Strasser was put in charge of reorganising the party, and very quickly, thanks to the efforts of both him and Goebbels especially, by the end of 1928, the party had over 100,000 members. Adolf Hitler headed north on the 16th of November to solidify his recent gains. He went to speak at the gigantic Sportspalast Arena, the same arena the famous Total War speech by Goebbels would take place in, in 1943. Hitler was certain that in Berlin, the hotbed of leftism, the rally would be attacked, so he brought with him his personal bodyguard. These men were a select group who were completely dedicated to the Fuhrer, even at the cost of their own lives, ranging between the ages of 18 and 20. They were called the Schutzstaffel, or SS for short. Hitler was right about the hecklers, but once he began shouting, they were quickly drowned out, and he dominated the audience. Quote, Whoever shows his fist to the German people, we will force to be our brother. He then went on to speak of the racial state of Germany. Quote, the bastardization of great states has begun, the negroization of cultures, of customs, not only of blood, strides forward. The world becomes democratized. The value of the individual declines. The masses, apparently, are gaining the victory over the idea of the great leader. Numbers are chosen as the new god. End quote. 
He continued on, We fight against the idea of numbers and the delirium of the masses. We want to see those who are superior take the reins of government in their hands. There are only 100,000 among us for whom voting is of no consequence, only the authority of the leader, and those 100,000 know that democracy in itself is a deception." End quote. He had completely won over the audience, as usual. At first, the vast majority of the crowd had never even heard him speak before, and they entered the arena as skeptics at best, but now they were in awe of him. One of the fascinated young men in the audience was Albert Speer, a man who had become one of Hitler's closest confidants. He said of Hitler, To me, there was something engaging about it, all the more so since it ran counter to everything the propaganda of his opponents had led me to expect. A hysterical demagogue, a shrieking and gesticulating fanatic in uniform, he did not allow the bursts of applause to tempt him away from his sober tone. End quote. He spoke of the classic Hitler, starting the speech slowly, reading the room, and then eventually erupting into the classic shouting style once he had the audience in his grasp. It wasn't only the working classes Hitler was targeting, however. He had won over the militant veterans and capitalistic businessmen too. He knew full well that getting into power would be ten times harder without them. He publicly joined with the Stahlheim, a rapidly nationalistic veterans association, and also with Alfred Hugenberg, Germany's biggest film and press lord, but more importantly, leader of the right-wing German National People's Party, against the new American formula for paying reparations, the Young Plan. In the meantime, the party was enjoying their new relationship of convenience with big industry. Hitler brought the Barlow Palace, a three-story building on the Briennestrasse, as the party headquarters, this would be known as the Brown House. Hitler moved himself from his tiny little apartment to one of the most fashionable sections of Berlin across the river. He took a nine-room apartment covering the entire second floor of a building. He brought along his previous landlady and her mother from his previous residence. Adolf's sister, Angela, remained in charge of the Berghof in the Bavarian mountains, but allowed her daughter, Gelly, to come and live in a room in her uncle's new apartment. Here, they would immediately begin to spend a lot of time together, and were often seen out together at the theatre or at his favourite table in the Café Heck, where he visited frequently. For hours, he would be dragged around with her, shopping, no matter how much he hated it. He confessed to his photographer, Hoffman, quote, how he hated it when Gelly tried on hats or shoes, or inspected bale after bale of material, engaging the shop girl in earnest conversation for half an hour or more, and then, finding nothing that suited her, walked out of the shop, end quote. Adolf knew this would happen every time, but ultimately took her to these places wherever she pleased regardless. At the same time as whizzing her around to all these places, however, he maintained his role as the father figure in Gelly's life. Gelly's actual father had died when she was just two, at the age of 31. Her social life was restricted by Hitler so that she wouldn't get herself into trouble. She nagged and nagged Uncle Adolf to go to events, and even when he did allow her, like in the case of a shrove tied bull, it was under rigid conditions. She had two escorts, and they were to bring her back at 11pm. Hoffman, one of the escorts, warned Hitler that restrictions like this were making her incredibly unhappy, but Hitler simply replied that it was his duty to watch over his niece and keep her out of trouble. He said, quote, I am quite determined to see that she does not fall into the hands of some unworthy adventurer or swindler. Hitler met a similar girl at the same time as this, who worked in Hoffman's Photoshop. Her name was Ava Braun, and one day, she would become Ava Hitler. She was a pretty 17-year-old girl who was the daughter of a teacher and a modern girl, much like Gelly. She preferred jazz to opera and American musical comedies to dramas. One teacher recalled, quote, She was a terror, it's true, the troublemaker of the class, but she was intelligent and quick to seize the essential aspects of a subject, and she was capable of independent thought, end quote. They met on a Friday afternoon in early October, Ava was up on a ladder, reaching for some files on top of a cupboard. She later recalled to her sister, At that moment, the boss came in, accompanied by a man with a funny moustache, a light-coloured English-style overcoat, and a big felt hat in his hand. They both sat down on the other side of the room, opposite me, end quote. She sensed immediately that Hitler was checking her out. After she climbed down, Hoffman introduced them to each other, and a few minutes later, they were all sitting down drinking beer and eating sausages. She remembers... I was starving. I gobbled my sausage and had a sip of beer for politeness's sake. 
The elderly gentleman was paying me compliments. We talked about music and a play, as I remember, with him devouring me with his eyes all the time. Then, as it was getting late, I rushed off. I refused his offer of a lift in his Mercedes. Just think what Papa's reaction would have been, end quote. Just before she left, Hoffman took her aside and asked her, haven't you guessed who that gentleman is? It's Hitler, Adolf Hitler. Ava simply replied, oh? Over the following days, Adolf Hitler would often drop into the Photoshop with flowers and candy for his, quote, lovely siren from Hoffman's. On rare times, he took her out, and they usually ended up watching a movie or sitting in an obscure corner of a cafe. He never visited his usual places with Ava. By the beginning of the year, however, the visits dried up. Ava had been boasting to her workmates about how she was Hitler's mistress and that he was going to marry her. Hoffman invited her to his office, and given that he knew full well that she had never even been to his apartment, confronted her about the lies. She broke down into tears and confessed. Hoffman threatened to fire her if she kept repeating the story, but clearly, in the end, this didn't put Hitler off. In late 1929, there was a plebiscite held regarding the Young Plan. The results were shattering for Hitler and his allies. They needed 21 million votes to defeat the measure, but only got less than 6 million. Many were saying that Hitler's career was going nowhere. The British ambassador to Berlin at the time wrote that he had been, quote, fading into oblivion ever since 1924. Those calling that it was over for Hitler, however, were essentially shorting a stock at the bottom. The year was 1930, and from here on out, Hitler's star would grow only brighter. An incredible propaganda victory came almost immediately. One of Hitler's most fanatical brown shirts, a 21-year-old boy named Horst Vessel, was murdered. Vessel and his girlfriend had moved into an apartment, but ended up falling out with the landlady. In an effort to evict them, she turned to some communist friends of hers. Once they realised the Vessel was an SA member, however, they simply walked up to the door and shot him dead. The opposite sides immediately began a propaganda war. The communists claimed that Vessel was a pimp and his girlfriend a prostitute. Goebbels, on the other hand, worked his magic. Quote, Leaving mother and home, he took to living among those who scorned and spit on him. Out there, in a proletarian section, in a tenement attic, he proceeded to build his youthful, modest life, a socialist Christ, one who appealed to others through his deeds. End quote. Then, whilst Horst lay dying in the hospital, Goebbels went on to play a poem that he had written called Raise High the Flag at the end of a party meeting in the sports palast. It went, the banners flutter, the drums roll, the fifes rejoice, and from millions of throats resounds the hymn of the German revolution, Raise High the Flag. On the 23rd of February, Vessel died. His spirit had risen in order to live on in all of us, proclaimed Goebbels. Then an extravagant funeral was arranged with Hitler delivering the final speech. In the end, Hitler was persuaded not to attend due to safety concerns in Red Berlin, and the funeral went on without him. Goering, the one who had persuaded Hitler not to go, was proven right as the funeral turned into a battleground. Communists arrived and began to attack the mourners. Goebbels couldn't have asked for a better propaganda coup. As they stood there, laying young Horst into his grave, stones were being pelted at them and landing in the hole. He later said, quote, There went up outside the gates the depraved cry of the subhuman. The departed, still with us, raised his weary hand and beckoned into the shimmering distance. Forward, over the graves, at the end of the road, lies Germany. In the end, Vessel would go down as the biggest martyr of the National Socialist cause, at least until someone else's death in 1945. A song he had written became at first the anthem of the NSDAP, and then, as soon as the party came to power, it was the official co-national anthem of Germany. It is simply known as the Horst Vessel Song. Two months after Vessel's funeral, a new crisis arose in the party. Once again, it was the Strasser brothers. This time, Otto. Otto Strasser had taken over his brother's newspapers since Gregor was now in Munich. Whilst officially meant to be National Socialist newspapers, this was only the case in name only. Otto used them to pump out views that were completely at odds with Hitler's. In April 1920, Otto supported a Saxon metal workers' strike against Hitler's wishes and industrialists who had been backing Hitler were furious. If Hitler wanted more subsidies, he had to crack down on Otto. Hitler tried frats at first, but these failed, and eventually the two ended up meeting at a Berlin hotel. After seven hours of debate, all it did was reveal their differences and widen the split. 
Otto was furious that Hitler was following the Benito Mussolini line and dealing with industrialists. Hitler returned to Munich privately furious, but publicly tried to ignore the issue. Quietly, he began to expel those from the party who were contributing to the rogue newspapers. Then, in June, he gave Goebbels instructions to purge Otto and his men from the party. He said, The National Socialist Party, as long as I lead it, will not be a debating club for rootless men of letters and chaotic salon Bolshevists, but will remain what it is today, an organisation of discipline, created not for doctrinaire foolishness or political van der Vogel, but dedicated to fight for the future of Germany, in which class distinction will be broken and a new German people will decide its own destiny." End quote. Within a few weeks, the party was being cleaned up. Otto called for a general exodus of socialists in the party, and only 24 others joined him. Even his brother, Gregor, rejected him, signing a declaration that he was dedicated to Adolf Hitler and submitted to his leadership. With the elections coming up in September of that year, Adolf Hitler was in good shape. In 1930, Adolf Hitler had something to offer to every kind of German. From wealthy industrialists to the down-and-out drifter like Hitler was himself all those years ago in Vienna, his message was resonating. The year prior, the Wall Street crash had brought a dramatic end to Germany's economic recovery, and extremism was officially back on the table. The people were not content to be dragged up and down depending on the tides of international capitalism which they had no control over. The German wanted Germany to be dependent on itself not New York and London. This was exactly what Hitler was offering, and his call was answered. By late summer, almost three million Germans were unemployed, and Chancellor Brüning was only making matters worse with useless policies. Goebbels' newspaper, Der Angriff, proclaimed to the poverty-stricken workers of Germany, Working Germany, awake, break your chains in two. To the farmers, whose profits had been wiped out by the worldwide decline in prices, Hitler offered import duties and tax adjustments. To the lower middle class, with no unions to fight for them, he offered hope. To those above them, on the ladder of society, self-respect and a way to escape the shame of poverty. Most of all though, to the young idealists, whether they be a university bookworm or a brawling brown shirt, Adolf Hitler offered an idealistic new world. The last group ate up Hitler's speeches. These men, disgusted by the hyper-individualistic Weimar society that they had been brought up into, were absolutely dazzled by Hitler's speeches preaching against materialism and selfishness. Hitler's calls for volunteers for his crusade to eliminate class barriers and to unite society were met by millions of these young men. One young follower recalled, you had to live through it to understand it. You felt like something was moving and the terrible stagnation was over. Even the social elite and royalty itself were drawn in by Hitler's message. August Wilhelm, Kaiser Wilhelm's fourth son, wrote personally to fellow veteran of the Great War, Adolf Hitler, telling him that it was his heart's desire to inform him personally that he had just been admitted to the party. The letter read, It was for me a very emotional moment, and my thoughts turned to you in loyalty. His adoration of Adolf Hitler led others like Prince Philip von Hessen, grandson of Queen Victoria and nephew of the Kaiser, to also join with the NSDAP. An early party member summed up the Hitler phenomenon well. What our hearts compelled us to think was this. Hitler, you're our man. You talk like a human being who's been at the front, who's been through the same mess we were, and not in some soft birth, but like us, an unknown soldier, end quote. That summer, before the elections, Hitler went on a gruelling campaign over the last six weeks, delivering 20 major speeches. He went around eating with the working class, kissing babies, and mixing with the crowds. He was rapidly winning the hearts of thousands of desperate souls looking for a saviour all over Germany. All over the country, it was Nazi season. As Goebbels organised 6,000 meetings in halls, tents, or in the open air, every town, city, or village of importance had torchlight parades and bright red posters everywhere. The Nazi newspapers blanketed the country with special campaign editions. Millions of copies were pumped out all over Germany. Those that couldn't be sold were given away. Then, the day of the election came. After a tireless campaign, it was time to see the results. All over the country, long lines queued up outside of polling places, and a record 35 million ballots ended up being cast. Four million more than in 1928. Hitler and his followers were not disappointed, and they were duly rewarded for their hard work. 
After several recounts for errors, it was announced that the NSDAP had won a total of 6,371,000 votes, over 18% of the vote. This officially made the party the second biggest in the entire country. For comparison, at the last election in 1928, they had won 810,000 votes. The National Socialists were not the only winners of this election, however. The Communists also made substantial gains, winning over 1.3 million votes than last time. The Social Democrats, however, had only lost 60,000 votes, so all these new voters were coming from the middle classes. The biggest gains for the NSDAP also came from farmers and the lower middle class in the more rural areas, and also especially Protestant areas in the north. It truly really was becoming, or rather had become, a nationwide phenomena, and things would never ever be the same again. Hitler knew his final victory was inevitable, and he would be in power. Just after the elections, he immediately called up his close associate, Ernst Hampstegel, and asked him if he would take over the post of foreign press chief of the party. He followed up his proposition by saying, Great things are before us. In a few months, or at the most in a couple of years, we must irresistibly sweep to power. You have all the connections and could render us a great service." End quote. Upon accepting this position, Hampstegel was immediately bombarded by foreign correspondents wishing to interview Hitler. Hitler was no longer speaking as another figure from one of the Reich's many parties. He was now the leader of the second biggest party in the entire country, and his words about revoking the Versailles Treaty and the Young Plan were reaching foreign ears and being taken seriously. On the 13th of October, the 107 Nazi deputies marched into their first session of the Reichstag, all wearing brown shirts. Each one of them answered the roll call with a resounding, present, Heil Hitler. Until 1931, Mein Kampf had sold on average just over 6,000 copies a year, which wasn't bad at all, financially speaking. Now, in the last year, the amount rose to 54,086 copies sold. Now, Hitler had a very respectable personal income, which he was sure would continue to rise from here on out. On the first day of 1931, the Brown House was officially unveiled as the new party headquarters. It was funded by special contributions, profits from Hitler's rallies, gifts, dues, and obviously the book sales. On the second floor were the offices of Hitler, Hess, Goebbels, Strasser, and the SA. Hitler's office was huge and decorated in reddish brown. In it stood a large bust of Mussolini, and amongst the pictures on the wall stood one of his other idols, Frederick the Great. Another showed Hitler and his old regiment in Flanders. Hans Frank, Hitler's lawyer, recalled that Hitler was actually rarely there, and he would quote, breeze in and out. Instead, he was usually downstairs in the refreshments room, where he sat in his corner table, much like he had sat in the corner at the Mannerheim Hostel all those years ago in Vienna. The party growing so quickly wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, however. The growth led to a huge increase in bureaucracy in every department, as well as increased friction and jealousy. The most annoying by far was the SA. The vision of the SA had always differed slightly between Hitler's vision of a group to protect rallies and mobilise political loyalty, and the actual SA leader's vision of a militaristic arm of the party. The SA men were some of the most revolutionary in the party, and many were true socialists at heart. The oaths of loyalty to Adolf Hitler meant less and less as the party grew, and they were becoming an embarrassment to Hitler. They felt no need to tone down their violence for the civilian leaders in Munich like Hitler. First, he and Rom butted heads, and Rom went into a self-imposed exile in South America. Then came Pfeffer von Solomon, and he too had just resigned after attempting to demand a stronger SA. Things had even recently come to a head in Berlin, where disaffected brown shirts had revolted against the party on the grounds that they were hungry, overworked, and constantly exposed to injuries. Goebbels turned down their demands, and things kicked off. Hitler began to visit each SA meeting place, accompanied by armed SS troops, and called for reconciliation. Eventually, he managed just that, and control of the SA was handed over to him personally. The news was followed by wild cheers from the men, and the revolt was officially over, although this wouldn't be the last of the trouble the SA would cause. Hitler's promise to lead the SA personally was a rather empty one, and from 1931 onwards, a kind of de facto leader would rule instead of Hitler, who was to jure the leader. On January 4th, 1931, Rom was given command again after being recalled from Bolivia. He had been tempted back by the promise of having a fairly free hand over the 60,000 man strong organisation, and over time, he would begin to shape the SA in his own image. Almost immediately, another near revolt occurred. Hitler issued orders on the 20th of February to both the SA and the SS to stop fighting against the communists and Jews in the streets. He said to them, quote, 
I understand your distress and rage, but you must not bear arms. They grumbled and did as they were told, but after Hitler bowed down to the Weimar government and their demands that all political rallies must be approved by the police, they called a secret meeting on the 31st of March. All those present declared themselves against Hitler. The SA revolted and Hitler immediately set the SS on them. Within 24 hours, open resistance had ended. On April 4th, both Der Angriff and the Volkischer Bierbasher printed articles condemning the so-called push. Hitler went on yet another tour of SA groups and managed to once again calm them down. This time, however, the calm lasted for more than a month. All the uproar, though, had showed not only the disloyalty of the SA, but the loyalty of the SS. From now on, they would be by far the most important organisation, not the SA. As soon as the SA were back in line, however, once again, more trouble began to bubble up, but this time, just surrounding their leader. Ernst Rom came under heavy attack for his alleged homosexuality. Previously, Hitler had brushed away such criticisms, making statements such as, the SA is a collection of men for a particular political goal. It is not a moral institution for raising young girls, but an association of rough fighters. He added that a man's private life was his own, as long as it didn't interfere with the National Socialist mission. Many in the party didn't agree with this line of thinking, however, and it's unclear that Hitler himself even did. But ultimately, he cared more about unity than causing another uproar. There was whispers in the party that many of those purged in the recent SA revolt had simply been replaced with Rom's homosexual friends. Although these whispers remained whispers, it was clearly going to cause an issue in the future. Hitler spent the summer of 1931 consolidating the NSDAP. Now that it was the second biggest party in the country, he had a lot of work to do. The party and work, however, wasn't the only thing on his mind. A personal crisis had arisen, which would have terrible consequences. Hitler learned that Emil Maurice, his chauffeur and one of his oldest friends, was secretly engaged to his niece. Maurice had been embarrassed for a long time about his forbidden love, but eventually felt the need to come clean and confess to Hitler. Whatever Maurice was expecting from this, it certainly didn't go the way he hoped. Hitler flew into a rage, immediately dismissing him as his chauffeur and accused him of disloyalty. Most around Hitler were convinced that this is simply him acting as a concerned relative. His affection was that of a father, said his housekeeper, Annie Winter, years later. He was only concerned with her welfare. Gelly was a flighty girl who tried to seduce everybody, including Hitler, and he merely wanted to protect her. How you view Gelly's life with Hitler depends on your worldview. He gave her absolutely everything she could possibly want in the world, except one thing, freedom. Everywhere she went, she had an escort even at her singing lessons. She would complain to a relative that life was hard and lonely. Many, including Ernst Hanfstegel's wife, were convinced that Hitler was trying to, or was, with Gelly, but that Gelly was a rather unwilling partner. Frau Winter, the housekeeper though, continued to insist that she was the one chasing him, not the other way around, and that because he knew how she acted, he wanted to keep her safe from the world. Quote, Naturally, she wanted to become Frau Hitler, he was highly eligible, but she flirted with everybody. She was not a serious girl." End quote. It was no secret that Gelly was very impressed with her uncle's fame. When the two would sit at the table at the Café Heck, they would be besieged by admirers, many of them women who kissed Hitler's hand and begged for souvenirs. So ultimately, any accusations that they had sexual relations are almost certainly nonsense. Even the idea that they were together is ridiculous. But whether he was a repressive uncle who kept her locked up to prevent her being promiscuous out there in the world, or whether he was doing the right thing by doing this, is ultimately down to you to decide based on your own worldview. Whether he had feelings towards her is neither here nor there, as he never told anyone, and we have no way of knowing. Either way, he did not act on it. By September, Gelly was involved with another young man, an artist from Austria. He had even proposed to her. As soon as Hitler learned of this, though, he went berserk and forced her to break her off with the blessing of his sister, and Gelly's mother, Angela. In mid-September, Gelly ran off and set off for Vienna. She headed first to the Berghof to see her mother, but as soon as she arrived, a phone call arrived from Hitler demanding her to return home. When she came back, the two constantly argued, and she was often seen running away from him with tears in her eyes. One time, she ran up to her room and stayed there. Hitler had to leave for a trip, and as he left, she shouted, Service, Uncle Alf, a polite, friendly greeting in German. At the door, Hitler stopped, looked back, and then fondly stroked Gelly's cheek and whispered something. Gelly remained stiff and resentful, however, and went off to tell the housekeeper that, quote, Really, I have nothing at all in common with my uncle. As Hitler drove off, he turned to Hoffman and said, I don't know why, but I have a most uneasy feeling. He was right. 
Later on, there was a sound upstairs, but the others in the house dismissed it. Gelly must have picked up a perfume bottle from her dressing table and broken it, said one woman. This was more than likely Kelly rummaging around through Hitler's pockets. In them, she found a letter from Ava Braun, who Hitler was now seeing again, but so secretly that Gelly didn't know. It read, Dear Herr Hitler, thank you again for the wonderful invitation to the theatre. It was a memorable evening. I am most grateful to you for your kindness. I am counting the hours until I may have the joy of another meeting. Gelly angrily tore the letter into four parts before storming off into her room with strict instructions not to be disturbed. Everyone else in the house respected her request, but they did hear a dull sound during the night. However, they thought nothing of it. In the morning, the other ladies in the house became alarmed that Gelly had still not left her room, and she wasn't answering their shouts. They summoned the locksmith, who duly arrived, and opened the door. To everyone's horror, they found Gelly dead on the floor, next to a pistol. She was shot in the heart. That morning, Hitler and Hoffman were driving when they spotted a car behind them. It was a taxi and a messenger. The messenger boy informed Hitler that Hess was calling from Munich and holding the line, so Hitler headed back to his hotel and picked up. Hoffman heard Hitler say, Hitler here, has something happened? And then after a short pause, oh god, how awful. Then his voice changed into an almost scream. Hess, answer me, yes or no, is she still alive? But he got no reply, and Hess had either hung up or the line was cut. Hitler burst into a total frenzy, and they all rushed back to Munich as fast as the car would take them. The entire journey, Hitler sat gazing out of the window, looking empty. When he returned to Munich, he found the papers full of sensational stories that he had killed his own niece, which was obviously impossible, as he was in Nuremberg at the time, but regardless, they got to Hitler. All kinds of crazy stories were being spread, and he supposedly told his lawyer that, quote, he could not look at the paper anymore, since the terrible smear campaign would kill him. He wanted to step out of politics altogether and not appear in public anymore. Hitler set off to a quiet house in the countryside of a friend to recollect himself. All night, Hitler paced around for hours and didn't sleep, and no one could get him out of his depressing mood. For two days, he paced around aimlessly and didn't eat a single spoonful of food. Finally, once he received a phone call from Frank, who had taken the necessary legal steps to deal with the press campaign, he said, I thank you. I will get myself back together again. I will never forget you for this. The funeral was held in Vienna. Rom, Himmler, and Frauenfeld, the self-appointed National Socialist Gauleiter of Vienna, were all present. Hitler himself was banned from entering Austria due to his politics, but risked the rest and attended anyway. Hitler was taken in a non-conspicuous car to the cemetery and placed flowers on her grave. Before heading back home, Hitler broke his long silence and asked his driver if they could pass the opera. At least drive by, even though I cannot go in, he said. They did so and headed off home. Hitler gazed out of the window on the way and said, So now, let the struggle begin, the struggle which must and shall be crowned with success. A few days later, he drove north to attend the Gauleiter Conference. On the way, they stopped at an inn overnight. At breakfast the following morning, he refused to eat a piece of ham and said to Goering, It is like eating a corpse, and then claimed that nothing on this earth would make him eat meat again. He had made remarks to Hess before about becoming vegetarian and then not followed through, but this time he meant it, and he never ate meat again. Everybody, Adolf Hitler included, knew that his journey would not end here, and that something big was on the horizon. Clearly, the current system in Germany wasn't working, and year by year, where things didn't improve, more and more people began to put their faith in Hitler's movement. Next time, we'll cover how Adolf Hitler maneuvered the political climate of the all-important years of 1931 to 1933 that would change his life and the world forever. After this, there was officially no turning back, and he almost overnight became the most talked about man in the world. Thank you very much for watching. If you watched this far, then please do leave a like and comment as it helps get the video out there immensely. I hope you're enjoying this series as much as I enjoy making it, especially now that we're about to get to where things get really interesting. Most of all though, before I end this video, a huge thank you as always to my patrons. I cannot put into words how much they have helped me out over the past few months. I won't drop Zuma Historian Law all over the main YouTube channel, but things have been tough and without their support, I wouldn't be able to get these videos out, and they know how much I appreciate them. So if you do enjoy these videos and have a few spare dollars lying around each month, please do consider signing up by clicking the link in the description for as little as $2 a month to join our Discord server and our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, or if you just want to support me. Thank you to lobster to you, Darway Lololol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Lanza, Friendly Brian, Mr. Balabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Henry Unruh, Evan Brightfield, Chef Jeff, and Ethan Wynn Stanley.